Well, welcome. Uh, this is another in my series of crossing the boundary interviews with people who have made major shifts in their uh, direction of their lives and their consciousness. And uh, you can uh, check out other recordings uh, on this series at my uh, YouTube site, Alan Levin, and uh, the particularly the Crossing the Boundary series. So today I'm really uh, happy to be talking with my friend, a good friend, uh, Dr. Ed Tick, uh, who is uh, a real truly Renaissance man in many ways. Uh, he, I just want to mention first off that he has a website that both he and his wife, Kate uh, Das, Dostead, is that how you say it? Dostead. Close enough. Yes, Close thank enough. you. <laughs> uh, it's called mentorthesoul.guide. And someday I'm going to have to find out how you get guide.guide .guide to be a, uh, you know, a way to put your website. I never heard of that. It's beautiful. It's new, it's, but um, it's and, new and available. I'll tell you, we can share yeah, that after. Yeah. A sanctuary for healing and growth. And there's lots of information, lots of information about the many things that um, Ed is uh, involved in and does. Uh, I want to uh, mention that he has been, as far as I know, at least uh, a student and teacher of mythology, of depth psychology, Jungian psychology, trauma healing, uh, dreams, poetry, uh, I'm sure other things that I may have not uh, written down and covered, but uh, I will talk about some of these things, hopefully uh, get into depth on some of the things that you've been doing. Uh, Ed has also taken groups on guided tours of Greece, uh, where his in-depth knowledge of the mythology and the sacred sites has been helpful in having people tune in to the healing uh, and guiding divination sources in Greece and Greek mythology. He has books, uh, one which we'll talk about more, I think, is his most recent book that's just coming out uh, called Coming Home in Vietnam, a poetry uh, book about his experiences in, in Vietnam and all the incredible work he's done there. Um, a book called Warrior's Return, Restoring the Soul After War. Another book, War and the Soul, Healing Our Nations, Veterans for PTSD. And from these book titles, you get some sense of uh, the very powerful work you've, you've done, Ed, and listeners will, will learn about uh, in working with veterans and working particularly on healing the uh, wounds of war. PTSD, moral injury, trauma, and so forth. Um, along those lines, uh, Ed has founded a group called Soldier's Heart, a program to transform the emotional, moral, and spiritual wounds that often result from war and military service. Um, and uh, he also founded and directs, along with Kate, International Friendship Fund which helps direct resources to Vietnam. So with all of that going on, Ed, I don't know how you had time to do this interview, um, but um, let, let's start a little bit with uh, Soldier's Heart. It's um, quite incredible what you do there. Can you give a little bit of summary for, I know you, you have resigned from actually doing that project, but it was a, for a number of years, a very powerful part of your life. So can you describe what Soldier's Heart is all uh, about? Sure, I can, and I can fit it immediately into our theme of crossing boundaries. Uh, first, just um, to be clear, um, Kate and I founded Soldier's Heart as a nonprofit and ran it as a nonprofit for 13 years. The nonprofit has ended legally, officially, but now we're still doing the soldier's heart work and consider mm -hmm. the soldier's heart program part of our 
uh, uh, private practice. So the work goes on just in different uh, legal and, and uh, institutional format. The most the much more important part is what we what Soldiers Heart does and, and how it contributes to crossing boundaries. I've been working with I first and this is also crossing boundaries. I am not a veteran. Uh, many people, when they are first exposed to my work or see my books, assume that I'm a veteran and that I'm doing this work because I'm a veteran and that it's about healing myself as well. Uh, we all have collective, uh, we all carry epigenetic trauma impact, ancestral trauma and impact, um, and collective trauma from what our culture, our times, our history does. So uh, I could talk at length about that, but I certainly own that I carry in my mind, heart, and soul uh, familial, ancestral, and collective uh, trauma, and certainly from our Jewish experience very much so from my ancestors and also from uh, you know, our father's generation from World War II and what was that was passed on to us. Okay, in addition to that, uh, I did not have to serve in the military during Vietnam. Everybody doesn't even know the history, so I don't wanna give a whole history of the era for the younger people, but for though briefly, um, briefly, uh, there was a draft Many of us were excluded or exempted from the draft. I was exempted with a student deferment my first year in college. Then the draft was done away with in the lottery system, pulling numbers, uh, birthdays out of a hat or who serves first, second, third was instituted. Uh, I got a high lottery number after uh, protesting the war for years. I, be I began early in high school to protest that war and continued in college and was applying for conscientious objector status and had decided if I was drafted, the only way I could possibly serve would be as a medic trying to heal in the midst of the hell of war. And then I got a high lottery, uh, lottery number and didn't have to do anything. Uh, many of our generation got out of service that way, but I considered that to be, well, it's a national moral injury that war harmed our entire generation and our entire culture, whether or not we were in it. Uh, I embraced the collective moral injury uh, and the impact of the war on me as somebody who wasn't serving. I was also, um, and during the anti-war movement, I also uh, had encountered some significant violence against me, against protesters, including having a bayonet right here against my chest during the National Moratorium Against the War in Washington. Okay, all that is to say that uh, I became alienated from our country. Uh, our generation was broken into pieces and still significantly is broken into factions from that historical and that wartime experience. And uh, I got my master's degree in 1975 in psychology. The year the war ended, I moved to a rural part of central New York State in the Hudson Valley, you know it well, we were sort of neighbors then. Uh, and very early as I began practicing, Vietnam veterans started to come into my practice. Uh, they crossed the boundary to come in for help uh, because they were desperate. Uh, and I realized immediately, oh, they are in a different world. A post-traumatic stress disorder was not a diagnosis yet. That didn't happen until 1980. I realized immediately they're in a different world. Their minds, hearts, and souls are still in the war zone. They can't come home and cross once they've been sent across the boundary into war. And there's no way that they know how to come back across that boundary and rejoin our society. And over time and to this date, very little that uh, the mainstream society does or conventional psychology or the Veterans Administration do help them cross the boundary to come home, to return again. Yeah. And they're so alienated there that I realized I had to cross the boundary in myself yeah. without preparation, without training, but they were all alone. And if I was gonna do this, 
it was in a sense going to war in the imaginal realm, in the emotional realm. Yeah, I was going to, you know, it occurs to me to ask you, did it, did it ever go be part of your concern when you were working with them, especially in the early days, that God, if they only knew who I am, who, what, what, where I've been during the war, like uh, that I'm a, one of those anti-war protesters? Uh, oh, yes, that was actually a big part of the work. Um, earlier on, now it's not an issue anymore because with my experience in the field, not always, but usually I'm given significant uh, respect and gratitude uh, and trust that I'm really one of them. And I have been initiated into the veteran world and, uh, well, adopted, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, been given ritual uh, and initiated as an honorary veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not an issue now, but it was very much an issue, I'd say, for the first 10 years of the work, mm -hmm. especially with Vietnam veterans being so profoundly alienated from the rest of our generation and from our society. And they also really need us more than just about any other um, demographic in therapy. They demand honesty and nakedness. Who are you? Why are you doing this work? Do you really care? What did you do, do during the war? Uh, what gives you the, the right, the power, um, the, the wisdom to do this work? And basically, should I trust you? Or were you one of them against, against me before? So they, they want to know. And uh, I, earlier on in, in the work, um, it was really challenging to earn my place among mm -hmm. them and to demonstrate that, and this is all for all our, our therapists, we don't judge them, we don't pathologize them. Uh, we realize they have experience crossing a boundary. They have experience in the underworld, in the, the realms of human suffering and hell that most of us don't have. And yeah. we need to be utterly receptive, open-hearted, um, courageous, yeah. uh, allow ourselves to feel the pain and to be initiated by what they're sharing yeah. with us. Yeah, and you... to, not, to not impose our psychological models on them right. because it's not consistent with their inner experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I know that you uh, have done a lot of work with looking at the warrior archetype and how there's a positive uh, human uh, ability to uh, embrace that in ways that are constructive and helpful in the world. Um, and I, I also know that you did this amazing thing, which was that you actually brought Vietnam veterans and then later on veterans of other wars to Vietnam to meet with the warriors on the enemy side and yes. have reconciliation ceremonies. So to talk a little bit about the warrior archetype as you understand it and how it can play a role in healing uh, people who have had the traumas of war and also how these um, trips to Vietnam have been a part of that kind of healing. Sure. Uh, first, let us say, let us affirm, we both know this, but for all of our friends out there, the archetypes are universal patterns of image and story that exist in the psyche that recur throughout history in all times, all places, all cultures, and yeah. recur yeah. in our individual lives. So, the archetypes are there. They seem to be built in, they're certainly built into the psyche and they seem to be built into the universe and they unfold in us individually and collectively. They look and appear differently in different cultures, of course, but the underlying is universal. So the Madonna and child are archetypes. Father and mother are archetypes. The warrior is an archetype. It exists in all people, all times, and all places. Now, the way it's developed and nurtured in a particular culture and the way it's developed and nurtured in the different genders in that culture is going to vary greatly, but the archetype itself is universal. So a samurai warrior, um, Joshua of the Bible, <laughs> the ancient Israelite warriors, 
uh, the Greek and Roman warriors, American Minutemen, Civil War soldiers, modern special operations uh, forces. They're all part, versions of the warrior archetype. Mm -hmm. Peace activists are also versions of the warrior archetype. Mm -hmm. My brother, you and I are also manifesting the warrior archetype in doing the difficult work we do in stepping into regions of pain and suffering and in trying to reduce them. The warrior archetype is beautiful and necessary. It's essential qualities and values are preservation and protection, not causing death and destruction. That's the shadow of the warrior. And tragically, the warrior archetype in having to preserve and protect sometimes needs to resort to violence and do violence in order to stop worse violence. Moral injury, we have now have the concept of moral injury as well as PTSD, and it's uh, not that old uh, in modern psychological thinking, but it's ancient. It's in the Bible. The King David was crying out about moral injury and begging God, like in Psalm 7, David says, if I for any reason cause my enemy undeserved pain or harm, then may God stop me and may I be uh, slain and reduced to the, into the dust before I harm another person wrong, uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, it's what we call PTSD and moral injury is they're both ancient, they're both throughout the Bible and world mythology. Uh, traditional cultures knew about these and, and address them. Let's say we, a little bit about the distinction. PTSD and moral injury. I'm not sure oh, everybody's okay. familiar with moral injury. Everybody's mm -hmm. heard at least of PTSD. If maybe they understand it, maybe they don't. But go ahead. What's moral injury? Sure. Okay. Well, PTSD is understood as actually, it's everybody thinks of it as a mental illness or pathology, and it's not. Mm -hmm. It is the normative way any sentient being will break down when he or she has or it has been exposed to overwhelming uh, degrees of life-threatening violence. Mm -hmm. So it's not only human beings that get have the traumatic breakdown, but uh, mammals as well. So it's, it is seen and known in, in, uh, in bears and wolves and parrots and dogs and cats and whales and dolphins. Uh, we could go on. Um, <clears throat> when Conscious, caring, connected beings that live in community are threatened by violence and their environment uh, decimated. They break down in this characteristic way. Yeah. Okay, moral injury is quite related and it shows mostly the same symptoms. So I think it may be an artificial distinction that we're drawing between PTSD so and moral injury. The way I understand but, that P mm -hmm. PTSD is referring in a, in a very simplistic way to say it is that PTSD is referring to violence or abuse that's done to you and moral injury is about violence or abuse you've done to somebody else. That's one simplistic way of understanding it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Okay. Um, over, overly, is that? Well, in, I have um, okay. I've been working with our veterans and military for over forty years, and I have almost never seen, almost never, uh, seen somebody manifesting PTSD but not moral injury. Yeah. Okay. And moral injury because it's not only doing harm to others, but moral injury is whenever we are involved in activity in which we do harm to others that. Um, that, that goes against our own most steeply held moral convictions. Right. And when we just see this being done, yeah. when we're in the presence of it, mm -hmm. um, we're not the perpetrator, but we're the witness. Yeah. And when we're participating in larger activities that do such violence to others, yeah. including as members of this nation, the United States, as citizens of the United States, that consistently, a nation that consistently uses uh, deadly force against other nations, and we disagree with it, and we can't stop it, then we also carry the moral injury. Yeah. It's, or it's a collective or, or injury. Or complicity in climate change, uh, climate disruption, yeah. and so forth. Yes. 
Yeah, so let's come back to Soldier's Heart and your journeys to Vietnam itself. Yeah, okay, thank you. So um, back to Soldier's Heart. So uh, after my um, beginning and my devotion, my crossing the boundary into the military and veteran world and saying, as a peace activist, as an old hippie, as a war prote protester, I'm going to go into this world. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn what the warriors knew. I wanted to give my form of alternative service. Uh, this is also transgenerational for me. Uh, my uncle and my godfather uh, was a, a medic at the Battle of the Bulge mm -hmm. and missing an action behind enemy lines for two months after that. And he came home, not with what we would call PTSD. He had shell shock. He was shaking and terrified the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, so that was the godfathering he gave me just to be in his presence and absorb the trauma. He could never talk about it. He just, I held him up while he shook sometimes. Uh, so back to soldier's heart. Okay. So. in searching for the most comprehensive and holistic means for helping our warriors heal and come home. I, uh, I have studied worldwide warrior traditions. I, ha uh, I did an 11 year apprenticeship with a Native American elder. Um, so I'm initiated in their tradition. And of course, Native American culture war, war cultures were warrior societies. Um, as you also know, I traveled to Greece and I'm an expert in ancient Greek tradition as well. And that those were warrior societies. So those two and others, I have been not just studying, but participating in warrior societies and the ceremonies and rituals shaped for their healing for decades. Mm -hmm. And so I've studied those uh, and including in the Jewish tradition and uh, in the Bible, I've studied profoundly study the Bible uh, for what it says about war and war trauma and war healing. Uh, and I've collected all of those lessons and kind of organized and abstracted them into an ideal form for a warrior's journey home. My books, War in the Soul and, and Warrior's Return report on these. Uh, there are six essential steps in a warrior's journey home that are universal. Also, the, some of these steps are found in the Bible. Uh, and they've been practiced for millennia by cultures all over the world. Again, in different forms based on the local culture, but the underlying is universal. Warriors all need purification and cleansing. Moses ordered a week of it for every Israelite soldier who returned from battle before they were allowed to go home and back to their village. We don't do that. We send people home immediately with the war still in them. So they act that out domestically in their communities. Warriors need um, to be tended by their community upon return because they're utterly stressed out, exhausted, and still uh, enraged um, and aroused. Uh, they, so they need a period of isolation and tending where they are completely honored and supported by the community, especially the older warriors. Again, we don't do that. Uh, truth telling, sharing their stories and having people witness the story, really hear it without censorship, the community receive it is necessary. We don't do that. Restitution for the warrior, atonement by the warrior for the destruction they did. So tikkun olam, Rebuilding the world that we've harmed uh, is necessary. Forgiveness is necessary, but not sufficient. Most moral injury groups uh, have their veterans confess what they did, but they don't do anything about it to repair the world. Mm -hmm. So there's forgiveness without atonement. We need the atonement practices as well. Mm -hmm. For restitution, we need the community to take responsibility, just as you and I said, we're responsible for global warming. We're responsible for what our nation is doing with the tax money we pay and the wars we fight. So people need, warriors need to hear, well, we need to have a transfer of responsibility for the moral injuries from the warriors who did them on the front lines 
to all of us who supported it and didn't stop it. So in Soldier's Heart, in our nonprofit, uh, Kate and I and our other colleagues created a full warrior's uh, map, roadmap for the warrior's journey home that includes the six necessary steps with lots of ritual practices to take people through those steps. So, uh, and retreats at homes, mini retreats for a day or longer retreats for four or five days a week. Uh, we take people in a, an organized uh, and ritualistic way through all of these steps. Uh, when we're overseas in Vietnam, uh, we do it for weeks and we, we practice these steps of return and these healing and restoration uh, atonement practices with the Vietnamese people. In Greece, we do it on the sacred sites and often with Greek people. Um, and we go to ancient warrior sites to really awaken the warrior archetype. We go to spiritual sites to help people um, enter altered states of consciousness through ritual practice um, and cross a boundary that way from our, our secular world into the spirit world. What kind of, okay. uh, what does a ritual look like? Does it include meditation? Is it act, acting out uh, some process? Uh, those and more, yeah. They're uh -huh. different forms of rituals. But, um, uh, <clears throat> well, in Greece, briefly, um, we, one of my books is called The Practice of Dream Healing. Uh, I'll have another book at, out a year from now called The Future of Ancient Healing. And these are, they, these document the forms of holistic healing practice done in ancient Greece that are the origins of medicine and psychology in the Western world. But they were very different than how we use medicine and psychology today. In essence, uh, medicine and psychology as we know it began in what the Greeks called a dream incubation. People would go to holistic sanctuaries, such as we have now, like Omega or Esalen. Uh, like the or, center of Asclepius. Uh, yeah, they were actually Asclepian centers where they received all of the holistic practices and more that we use today, but that wasn't the centerpiece of healing. The centerpiece of healing was once they were stabilized and ready and there were uh, psychological, spiritual signs that it was time to approach God they would be put through an intensive incubation process where they did dream questing uh, during which, uh, so they fasted, they prayed, they were in meditation, they were in isolation and watched over by facilitators. The so original do you do things like, uh, like that? Well, we do that. We replicate that exactly. Yeah, yes. I see. Yeah. 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 So we go to the sites where they happen. We study the practices. People meditate and, and pray for hopefully for weeks before we even get there. Certainly in Greece, we use theater extensively in Greece, uh -huh. um, but a version, well, mythic psychodrama. So we choose the ancient plays that match our modern people's struggles and challenges and sufferings oh, and we beautiful. enact beautiful. them so that the archetypes are awakened and we another crossing of the boundary you go from the individual this is my problem from my messed up family to the collective oh this is universal this is human i'm experiencing what oedipus experienced or what agamemnon experienced or my family i'm a, an abused uh, girl a woman in my family. Oh, I was sacrificed by my family for their own goals, like um, like Agamemnon killed his daughter to get the winds to go to Troy. There's so many, so many versions. So people identify with the myths. They realize the myths are active in their lives. They go into the collective and the global where we are really working with archetypal forces. Yeah. We are struggling with our uh, destinies that are much bigger than our plans and our own powers. Um, we're uniting with the forces of the universe and we're doing all this with meditation, with fasting, with prayer, uh, with storytelling from the past and connecting our stories to the eternal stories and then doing dream questing during which time people always have 
very, very big dreams mm -hmm. uh, of their own and mm -hmm. also the entire group that's not uh, doing the questing will also support and meditate and pray for them and also often have dreams about them as well. Mm -hmm. And then we spend a lot of time processing these, you know, as mm -hmm. uh, received visions from the deep psyche uh, that guide our journeys. So, so the people that, who go to people who go with you to Greece are, are not necessarily uh, military veterans. They're, well, no. They may include veterans, but it's not particularly geared. No, geared that's correct. I, I've led um, about 22 trips to Greece. Uh, a few of them have been warrior journeys. Uh -huh. and, uh, and two of them uh, on Veterans Day, on Armistice Day. We did healing, warrior healing ritual in the Valley of Thermopylae, right where the Spartans fell and are buried on Armistice Day, Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. uh, that really causes archetypal trembling and connection from our core. Mm -hmm. And then uh, mm -hmm. I wish you were there. Uh, I have the vision of at the end of the ceremony of one of our ceremonies of our warriors marching in honor up to the Spartans grave and praying before it and saluting the Spartans and then declaring their brotherhood to the Spartans yeah. and also naming what the Spartans had that enabled them to make such great sacrifice without breakdown uh, yeah. and what they as American warriors wish they had had that the Spartans did, but we don't provide our people. Mm -hmm. So that also provides yeah. that kind of breakthrough insight and then yeah, in there's, Vietnam, so many, there's, there's so many very interesting things that you can uh, talk about. And I did want to come back to Vietnam and the ceremonies that you do with, um, with the veterans and the uh, veterans of the, what we call the Viet Cong or the NLF, the National Liberation Front of Vietnam. Yes. And that, that, that's astounding uh, work in itself so mm -hmm. thank what's you what's that like well it's extraordinary uh it truly is so i've led 19 journeys to vietnam once a year beginning in 2000 uh, for the 25th anniversary of the end of the war uh, all the way until the, the pandemic stopped travel um and there too a, a lot of a lot of goals that about crossing boundaries um and understanding that PTSD is a frozen war consciousness. The psyche is still operating as if it were in the war zone, even though the person has been out of the war zone for years or decades. Mm. I thought going back into the war zone might unfreeze the psyche. If we could see Vietnam today, that the land and the people are recovering. If we can be in direct relation with the Vietnamese, uh, tell each other stories and exchange forgiveness if we could enter into a universal identity of uh, that we are all people who have survived the same hell that that might lift that frozen dimension of the war consciousness so that was my and we don't know the Vietnamese and what the impact of the war was on them um, and we need to finish the story by joining all of our stories together. So I had those ideas and goals in mind when I began these journeys, but they all have proven true and far, far, far beyond my understanding and expectations in so many ways. Vietnam is uh, primarily a Buddhist culture, about 90% of the people are Buddhist and you study uh, and teach Buddhist lessons as well and some of your other wonderful guests do. So we know the values of Buddhism. Uh, do no harm, the belief in karma, uh, the universality, the understanding that karma is not just individual but collective, um, the necessity to tend the soul, the realization of what violence and harm does and that the soul carries that with them and needs to be relieved of that. Uh, the goal to try to live a peaceful existence and not do violence to anyone anywhere. All of these things exist in Vietnam and the Vietnamese people truly embody them. Beyond that, they have many healing practices that 
we don't know about, we've never heard of that profoundly contribute to healing anybody who's survived trauma. So for example, of many practices, uh, they, um, well, here, one is that uh, what we have about 2000 remaining MIAs missing in action from the Vietnam War. The Vietnamese have over a quarter million. The war was so brutal. The technology was so devastating. Of course, people are vaporized. Um, there are many spiritual practices in Vietnam that help people not only resolve the loss of their loved one, but help the soul of the ancestor that may be suffering on the other side. So for one matter is they build what they call windy tombs, which are, if we can't find the body of a lost loved one, we build an empty tomb. And we do ceremony there to call their soul into the tomb. And after we do that, from then on, we treat it like it's the real tomb. And we visited on, on sacred days, on the holidays uh, set aside for this. And in the countryside, um, well, the Vietnamese believe that the souls of their loved ones remain here among us for a hundred years, four generations. Mm. And they talk to them, they relate to them, they tell them news of the family, they ask for help. And then and after a hundred years, they release the last generation and then we join. So there's continuity and respect uh, and communication between the generations. Well, uh, our veterans do that with the Vietnamese. We visit their windy tombs. Our veterans have prayed at windy tombs where they think they may have killed this person or you know, their friends or relations. Um, our veterans have brought artifacts that they took, war souvenirs they took, during battle when they were in the war, they brought them back to the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese teach that the artifacts of somebody who was died by violence carry the soul. So when you had that helmet or that flag, you had my grandfather's soul in America and it couldn't come back. Mm -hmm. Scouts honor, American veterans have reported nightmares of these figures that completely stopped when we returned the artifact. Like the soul was really here in America with the souvenir. And when we took it back and returned it to the Vietnamese, the soul went home and stopped haunting our veteran. And the Vietnamese report the same thing. You, re you returned my grandfather to me. He's home now. And you're not a former foe, you're my uncle who returned my grandfather to me, and now you're a member of our family and we love you. But I killed some, I killed your family. No, you didn't, you brought them home. But I'm responsible for this. No, you're not. You were a good warrior, warrior archetype. You were a good warrior doing what your culture wanted you to do and were told to do. A warrior's job is not to, in, in the battle to question that or you'll be dead. A warrior's job is to serve their country and it's the leader's responsibility for how they sent you. We're not angry at any American veterans. We just wish your government hadn't done this, but we would love you. And then messages from the Vietnamese. We are brothers and sisters who survived the same hell. These are quotes from Viet Cong, from Viet Minh and from North Vietnamese army regulars. We're brothers and sisters who survived the same hell. From now on, Vietnamese and American veterans must be the lips and tongue of the same mouth telling the world the same story. We know about your suffering in America. We're so glad you came here so you could share our stories. We know you can't come home in America. Please keep coming to Vietnam so you can come home here. We know you don't feel loved in America but please keep coming here so we Vietnamese can heal you with our love. Yeah. I've been there for, okay, I've been traveling there for uh, since 2000. So 19 trips there. I've spent by now about a year and a half of my life in that country. Um, and I've taken, I must be three or 400 Americans there by now. Not once for one second from a single person 
have I ever seen or have any of my travelers ever experienced uh, any messages of anger or animosity? Not at all, never, never. Um, and our people are always amazed. Uh, back to our theme, we do invite Americans, not just veterans. Uh, I've also brought veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan wars there because they can't go back to the sandbox, but they want the experience of reconciliation with former foes and family members, war widows, children uh, or orphans of veterans and peace activists and spiritual and, and how do you How do you find these Vietnamese soldiers, ex-soldiers that to do this with you? Ha. How do you make those <laughs> connections? Well, yeah, I do by now. But where I, why I laughed is because we really don't understand what it means to live in a communal culture. Really, we're on a, an old battlefield uh, surrounding uh, a few old foxholes that are still in, in the ground. And we're lighting incense. And one of our veterans is starting to tell his story of what happened there and crying. And suddenly there's a dozen Vietnamese around us, praying with us, asking to hold incense, incense sticks, um, offering to hug our veterans. And many of them, they don't speak English. They just, they're there, they appear. Children, we were on one battlefield and children appeared like 10, 11 year old children um, were re came out of their school because they had seen us and came running over to meet, to line up in front of our vets and salute them and thank them for coming and honoring them with a visit. And then they gave them their lunch money. And those were pennies to the Vietnamese. And that's all they could afford. It's a, still a very poor country. And our vets didn't want to take it. I was taking your lunch money. No, no, no. You're my you're my uncle from America and you finally came back to reunite our people. You have to take this little gift from me. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go without lunch today so I can tell my family I fed an American veteran. So you're so uh, you're just going out there with your soldiers and and uh, going to battlefield sites to pray and do ceremony and the Vietnamese actually meet you come to you uh, yes all the time and so the now, i also i also also do. also the uh, elders or the, probably now elders and people who were in the war well uh, i also yes i'm, I'm you very well actual meetings with them yeah in, of course by now i'm very well networked in vietnam um yeah and I have lots of uh, brothers who were, uh, who were uh, warriors in one or another faction. Uh, and, uh, and I work with them to arrange meetings. So we always stay, for example, we always stay uh, in the Mekong Delta in mm -hmm. the remote um, kind of camp home of a, a Viet Cong veteran named Tom Tien, who is the happiest, most loving, person I've ever met in my life because he was left for dead in the jungle and it would have it seemed like his survival story is absolutely impossible uh, but he survived and he really was at, at the knife edge of life and death and so he's so happy to be alive uh -huh. and he welcomes our veterans with the greatest joy we he he calls other veterans in from his community and we always have talking circles between Viet Cong veterans from the Delta and our veterans, mm -hmm. always. Um, and I do this all over the country. So I know, by now I know people very well and they are joyous in meeting American veterans and having these reconciliation mm -hmm. gatherings. Uh, in Hanoi, we meet with the Vietnam Writers Union and Vietnamese happily say, well, here in Vietnam, everybody's a poet. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I, so what does the reconciliation ceremony look like when you do it with the soldiers from the U.S. and soldiers from Vietnam? What well, di different versions depending on where we are. Uh, with the writers, with the poets, uh, the Vietnamese, we translate everybody's poems into both languages, Viet, uh, English and Vietnamese. And the poets will read each uh, their own poems to each other 
within a few minutes, the poet from the other side is jumping up saying, that's my poem, that's my story. I want to read that American's poem in my language so you'll hear my story also. And so within a few poems, the circles have broken up and everybody's sitting interwoven next to each other with their arms around each other, reading each other's poems and saying, your story is my story, we're the same. Mm -hmm. That's one way that it happens. Uh, another way it happens is uh, in storytelling circles um, where I need to tell you the story of uh, when I was almost killed fighting for a little hill at the Battle of Dok Tho, then a Vietnamese veteran. I was at that battle too. Which hill were you fighting over? <laughs> and literally, sometimes people discover they were fighting each other in that battle. Mm -hmm. Well, then again, they fall into each other's arms with a lot of foxhole humor. Ha, 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 you were a bad shot. You missed me that day. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, I was a bad shot too. So we both lived so we could live this, dif dif this distant day to finally becoming brothers like we were meant to be. Uh, there's that. We also do ex uh, significant atonement work. So we go where our warriors caused harm or destroyed. We've built two schools. We help Agent Orange victims. We've given um, homes, single family let, homes. Let me interrupt you. This, this yes. is part of the uh, International Friendship Fund that yes. is, uh, you and Kate uh, yes. direct to. It's kind yeah. of a distinct project where you Go ahead, you do these things that- Yeah, um, well, we identify a need in, uh, in a particularly uh, afflicted community. We raise the money to address that need. And then when we go to Vietnam, we have veterans who served in that community and harmed it, gift that community with the school or the house or water buffalo or pigs or sampans, whatever we're giving. So. The warrior who caused the who has moral injury because of the harm he does did directly gives the atonement practice back to the Vietnamese, and that cleanses his moral injury. Instead of I'm somebody who burned a hut down in this village, no, I'm somebody who built a home in this village for a destitute family, and they honor me and love me for that, and that balances the pain in my heart. It washes yeah. me clean and it gives me a new identity. I'm still a warrior, but I'm a warrior who preserves and protects and restores rather than just one who in yeah. the name of the United States destroys. Yeah. I remember, I always think in, about, and I think of moral injury and that kind of trauma that, of the Gan movie Gandhi and the, uh, guy who came in frantic that he had killed uh, somebody from the other side, a Muslim who killed a Hindu, and Gandhi right. said, well, you need to raise two Hindu children as your own. Raise mm -hmm. them as Hindus. Right, yes. Yeah, rest yeah. That kind of, it's very important mm -hmm. that the idea that it's not just the internal subjective experience of forgiveness, but the external acting out of some genuine atonement, some some restitution. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I want to uh, shift to something uh, more more personal, like um, how did you come to be this uh, warrior that you are and uh, healer that you are? Um, mm. Uh, going back, I usually start with like, well, what, we, what was it like growing up with your parents? But we kind of leap right into all the, or some of the amazing work that you do and have done. Where'd you grow up and what was it like? Uh, uh, I was born in the Bronx uh -huh. and spent my first six years. Which part? Uh, I don't even know. Right you know I was only there for well, two years. <laughs> uh, I was there for six years, so uh -huh. maybe my memories are a little stronger. Um, so I was born in the Southeast Bronx, the part that became Fort Apache later on. This was influential. I was, uh, of course, uh, on those streets, there were always gangs, so, so you had to be in the gang. Uh, uh -huh. I was in, I remember being in uh, gang fights before I ever got to kindergarten. And, uh -huh. and I remember sitting in the dirt with a Puerto Rican kid from the gang in the next street where we were sitting in the dirt playing and saying, why are our, the older kids from our gangs beating each other up? 
was much more fun to play together. Uh -huh. So even at that young age, I started crossing the boundary and working for reconciliation. Oh, and, you know, <laughs> being somewhat uh, tuned to the warrior aspect of your nature. So, and yep. you grew up in a Jewish family? So, yes. Yeah, so my family is Jewish. Um, my father's parents came from Russia and Poland. My mother's grandparents came from Austria, Hungary. Uh -huh. um, religious? My or grandparents were very, religious? my grandparents were all very religious, uh -huh. very religious. So my grandparents were all Orthodox. Uh, we moved to Queens and my family became conservative. I was pretty much raised in the conservative Long Island Jewish community, which was very disappointing. Um, we weren't affluent, but uh, many people around us were at least comfortable, not very affluent, but uh, lower middle class comfortable. Um, and uh, when you say disappointing, you mean as a kid, did you feel somewhat alienated in that? Uh, yes, I felt quite disappointed and alienated because I saw the sincerity of our grandparents' generation and of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. I appreciated to the degree that I knew our stories. I appreciated the profound degree of struggle and suffering that it took to get us here. I've always felt obligated to my ancestors to make something of my life. Many of us do. Mm -hmm. Pay them back. Make make their sacrifices really mean something. I've always felt that. And I was profoundly disappointed with the, uh, the shallowness and rote nature of um, the dominated uh, Queens and Long Island Jewry as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So I took it really seriously. I took it as seriously as my grandparents did. Um, and... Uh, the, the, the Jewish heritage. You mean. Yeah, the Jewish heritage. Yes, and, I was actually valedictorian of um, my Hebrew school, uh -huh. not in the Hebrew language, but in in Jewish studies, uh -huh. because I took it so seriously and I loved it, and I was looking for wisdom from it beyond what most people were living by. Would you say, uh, you know, I, I wrote this book called Crossing the Boundary about Jews who who kind of crossed over to embracing sometimes one specific other religion or spiritual path than Judaism. Um, you've talked a lot about Buddhism and uh, did, did at some point in your the trajectory of your teen years or was it in your twenties, you kind of opened to or embraced other kinds of religious traditions or spiritual traditions? Uh, yeah, um, I would say that uh, the 60s and how we grew up during the 60s and the influences from other cultures coming in because our culture was in such distress, that impacted me a lot. And I did study, uh, deeply study Eastern religions during that time. Also, when uh, psychedelics came into our culture and our use, uh, I actually resisted using marijuana and psychedelics for a while because I wanted to study first. I did a lot of studying, interviewing some elders, reading books about the sacred use of plants before I ever took any, so that I would be not just uh, using them recreational or for escape, but really looking uh, on ser serious spiritual searches uh, that might, that would open me up to other cultures and other ways of thinking. Uh, and um, we didn't, Maybe I didn't know the quote then, but in Jungian and archetypal psychology, uh, the elders teach and we practice that, well, Jung's phrase was to seek an experience akin to the ancients, not just be cognitive, not just think or analyze, but we need transformative experience such as the ancients once had. And so early on, I began seeking the experiences and uh and you know uh drug use in the 60s was part of that yeah. but would more than that, that the, would you say that your early experiences with psychedelics uh, um were life-changing in some way oh yes uh, i really literally know vividly remember during my college years i 
did two drips on acid and four on mescaline. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you what happened that was transformational on each one, but we don't have time for that. But mm -hmm. I did experience uh, the numinous spirit of the world breaking through its physical reality. Mm -hmm. And this is going to sound strange, but I also learned how to swim on mescaline. For whatever reasons, I would have always swim in been, the water. Swim in the water, really. <laughs> yeah, really. I've always been a very clumsy uh, swimmer with lacking confidence. I would have been an Eagle uh, Scout in the Boy Scouts if I had been able to get swimming and life-saving merit badge, and I couldn't. I got everything else. But then on a mescaline trip in the swimming pool in college, oh, I can do this like a dolphin. This is amazing. I can be at home in the water mm -hmm. again. And well, I achieved that. So from learning to swim like a dolphin to the, the numinous foundation of the cosmos breaking through, these were transformational. I only did six during college years. It's not a lot, but a vision quest from any form as we both teach practice should be so transformational and penetrating that it stays with us and changes us and we can always call on it and so from then till now i've worked on that for myself and to learn good ways to facilitate it uh, for others Wonderful. yeah and as you know and we've discussed before the so-called renaissance, the re-emergence of psychedelics into legal and even the, the kind of raising up of the awareness of what's called the underground psychedelic movement is having a, a big impact, hopefully will be instrumental maybe, or part of the instrumentation that will sort of alter the course of human um, history as it goes forward. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that brings us kind of to to the now. Here we are uh, on this journey. What's your What's your sense uh, at this point, Ed, of where it's all going? Your work and um, you know how hopeful are you that? Um, this uh, species that we're part of, we're participating in, is uh, going to make it through. Uh, I have faith in life and in the universe. So the universe will still be here. In mm -hmm. some form, the planet will still be here. Definitely. In some form. Uh, I rely and remember the CCC from the Depression Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. When I'm in serious despair and fear for our well-being, I say to myself, well, CCC, we may be gone, but the cockro cockroaches, crows, and coyotes will still be here because they're so adaptable. Um, but whether or not humanity is going to make, I really don't know. And uh, I'm really working to live in the moment of doing what is right and good is to the best of my ability and accepting that we can't know the outcome. On one hand, mythology gives me great support because world mythologies, the Bible, Greek and Roman mythology, Native American, Eastern mythologies, Hindu, they all have the world going through endless, and the universe going through endless cycles of destruction and recreation. And many of them tell us this is, you know, the seventh world or the 10th world or the hundredth world. And humanity continues to be uh, destroyed and then recreated. So on one hand, we are told that these are universal cycles that keep re, uh, visiting us. On the other hand, the tools we have for worldwide destruction have never been here before. We've never had the power to eradicate all of life and the, the environment like we are. So I don't know if we're going to survive this. I really don't. Um, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I appreciate that. It uh, mirrors my own view that, you know, we, we can't know for sure the outcome, but we can know our, our own beingness and we can know that what we're doing in the moment is contributing toward the good and toward the returning. Yeah. 
the great turning as uh, Joanna Macy talks about. And I think we, we, we share the perspective that the turning has to happen. Mm -hmm. That the breakdown that's happening is because we have so damaged uh, um, the, the world system on every level that it needs to break down and reconstitute itself, mm -hmm. hopefully with our cooperation. But if not, it's going to do it. And if we keep harming yeah. it, it's going to keep breaking down so that it can fix itself in the long run. Yeah. So we're part of that process. We are in apocalypse. Apocalypse means revealing what has been covered from the past. It doesn't mean just the breakdown. It means the revelation and the transformation. Mm -hmm. So this is difficult, but this has to be happening. And we have to embrace it and do our best to collaborate with it in a positive way. All right. Well, my friend, my brother, uh, it's been a pleasure. I, I know there at any point along the way, we could have gone into deeper, more, more uh, varied uh, takes on all of these different subjects that we talked about, that you talked about. Uh, but I, I think this offers a good taste uh, I really recommend people check out, uh, we didn't even talk about this, but the ad's upcoming book are just being released right now, yes. Coming Home in Vietnam. It's a book of poetry about the, some of the experiences that he was describing through Soldier's Heart and all of that work that he's been doing in Vietnam for many, many years. And um, check out his website, uh, mentorthesoul.guide. Great. And uh, I'll hopefully be seeing others of you sometime soon in another interview. Be well. Blessings to you all. Thank you. Ed. Thank you so much. Bless and blessings to everyone sharing this with us today and always.